I'm Lawrence Johns, this is The Magnificent Man Project, and this is Thursday for Knowledge. Today's conversation was with David Chambers of the Authentic Dating Series podcast. We went through some real important stuff, the need to be authentic, the need to kind of be who you are, and to stop treating dating like a game. So if you're interested in this, please watch on. Well, I'm sure you'll find someone somewhere who'll have you, J.K. Rowling. This is the Magnificent Man Project. I'm Lawrence Johns, uh, and this is Thursday for Knowledge. And today on Thursday for Knowledge, um, talking to David Chambers. Uh, David Chambers is uh, uh, a dating coach for, and many other things too, and, and part of the Authentic Dating podcast series. Um, and we'll put all the links for that in the bio. Um, David, thanks for coming. Really great to have you here in the group. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll allow you in a moment to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. But I wanted to thank you here. And I wanted to tell everyone watching that the reason I, I wanted you here um, is because what I really like about what you do is I've always kind of hated the idea of the dating game and and those kind of like, you know, how to trick your way into the hearts of uh, and beds of many women and I love that you bring a, a, an air of authenticity and put just being yourself at the center of it all um, so thank you for being here it's kind of central to what we do in this group kind of authenticity is one of the kind of central pillars um, so why don't you tell us a little bit you'll do a much better job of telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do yeah I am David Chambers um uh, now I, I go by as a, a, a men's dating and intimacy expert because I'm doing a lot of work now as well as in the dating and connection and authenticity world with men, helping them build deeper connections, be more authentic in themselves and communicate from that space and get more in touch with what they're feeling so they can create the connections they want. But also I'm doing a lot of work with men around kind of tantric intimacy and increasing intimacy in their relationships or even if they're dating learning ways in which they can, you know, be more deeply present when it comes to having sex, lovemaking or whatever. All areas of their life, actually, presence really leaks into beautifully. How long have you been doing that? Um, I'd say that I've been in the, in the coaching recently now. It's probably for about two years now I got back into, but I was way back probably about, oh, I think about it now, probably 12 13 years ago, I did uh, two years of coaching. I was just doing dating stuff then in the, in the days, like post the game coming out, um, kind of cutting my teeth in learning initially about authenticity. And it was almost an accident for me. Is just, I found that by being myself, bringing a good energy to people, bringing fun and enjoyment that I was having in my life and bringing that into my interactions, whether they be in bars and clubs, that it was, a, it was magnetic. You know, people wanted to be around it. And I, I've come to see you know, in between my kind of coaching stints is like living a life that we are passionate about, that we, that kind of has a hallmark of who we are is the most attractive thing we can do and the most attractive thing we can be. And that's kind of, it's interesting because that period after the game, you know, it was kind of pickup artist time, wasn't it? It was always like yeah. make sure you're wearing like one flip-flop and a cowboy boot. So you've got something <laughs> to about and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, it must have been kind of, well, I don't know, I'm assuming that. I mean, did you find it hard because the common narrative was about kind of inauthenticity, for want of a better word, or, or over-exaggeration of self? Um, did you find that hard or did you find it was a sort of niche that was just wide open for you? I think at the time it wasn't even, I wasn't so aware of, the fact that it was authenticity that was really beautiful for me and was really, you know, working for me. I think, you know, like many men, you know, I got into the, the that sort of work because I was frustrated in my own dating life. And I found that more than anything, it was lovely to come together with a group of men with a common goal of, you know, meeting more women or being better men really was what we were after. We wanted to be better men. Um, 
And there was a lot of, you know, people who were just kind of running lines, scripts, games, and all these things. And some of the stuff I even tried, like some of the, some of the kind of um, psychological games were quite fun to play more than anything, you know, to, to learn and, and find out about people. But I, out of that, I come to realize that just, just being yourself went a long way. So was it hard? I didn't realize what I was learning at the time. I was just doing me. I was doing my way of doing things. And I was teaching guys my way. I was like, you know, let's go into club, have a good time. Let's have fun. Let's have a laugh. Let's joke around and play around and enjoy ourselves. And the whole meeting women thing can be secondary. And for a lot of men, that was really difficult for them to grasp. And, you know, they've come to you to, to learn how to meet women, how to pick up women. You're saying, let's have fun first. So at times it was really difficult, but I found that a lot of people were like, oh, this is a breath of fresh air. I don't have to remember all these lines. I don't need to understand all these complex body movements. It was just like, oh, actually, let me have a good time, which for some men was actually very difficult because they had, they had a kind of relationship to being out in bars or clubs as it being hard and difficult and uncomfortable. So it's like rewiring of going, okay, this is a place for fun and play. How can we teach you how to to have fun and play in this area? Yeah. And I mean, that's one of the things that really interests me about, about what you do is that element of, first of all, the element of being yourself and that element of play, because like sort of massive, like I'll own my own judgments here, kind of judgment and generalization uh, alert. But like from a lot of men that I experience, there tends to be a tendency in almost in the masculine psyche to kind of approach everything as a problem to be solved. So it's kind of like, how do I, how do I get good with other? How do I get good with women? How do I get good with, it's the same way of like, how do I get good at football? How do I get good with this? How do I, how do I learn this? And, and that idea of, well, you might have to connect with something different. You might have to connect with yourself here and just be yourself and assume that that's enough and that that's going to bring people in. Um, so what's so what's some of the, like, when you're doing your coaching, what's some of the key questions that you get asked? By yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, I, I see more and more the sort of man that's coming to me who is looking for more. They're like, I want more from my relationships. I want deeper connection. I want to have better sex, but also they want less. They want less stress. They want less conflict, you know, and they want less turmoil, right? And they want less confusion. So I think some of the common things often is, you know, conversation is often a common one, right? For a lot of guys, it's like, you know, what sort of conversation should I be having on a date? What should I not talk about? How do I text? How do I not text? And inside of these things, this it kind of speaks into what you were saying there in kind of the the masculine is like, there must be a process. And also there's a a kind of hidden thing is that there must be a right way, right? There's two things inside the masculine. It's like, there's a process and there's a right way. And if I follow the process, I will get to, and and that is the right way. I will get to where I want to get to. Now, the problem when it comes to, to dating is, is there is no right way and there is no real process. There's no linear process and there's no right way. There's not one only way. Like you can think of, you know, you can think of some men who you might look at and say they're really, you know, desired by women. You can look at some rock stars, for instance, right? And then you might look at someone like, I don't know, I, th- I always think of this, uh, the guy, Dan Brazilian, the, uh, the ex-poker player, you know, okay. Or you think of maybe a George Clooney, and they're all different men. They have different attributes, different ways of being, right? But actually, they're not trying to be any one way. They don't look the same, but they've learned to just be themselves and be confident and comfortable in that. So inside a lot of the conversation pieces, it's just like, what do you want to talk about? What lights you up? What's interesting to you? What are you passionate about? And teaching men to be in their masculine and lead from a place of like what they're about so they're, they're kind of communicating. It's like, this is what I love. This is what I enjoy. You know, like for yourself, right? You love skating. Now, if you are, you're on Tinder and you're, for instance, and you're swiping, you'd say that you like skateboarding, right? Because if you don't, there's an inauth- inauthenticity there because that's something you love doing, right? And by talking about the things you love doing, you will, you will resonate or you attract the sort of women who are interested in those sorts of things, right? And it won't always be linear like, oh, you're going to meet women who like skateboarding. Maybe you meet women who are like, oh, 
oh, he's active. I really like that. Or he's just, that's interesting that he does skateboarding. That's not something usual. There must be something different about this person, yeah. right? So you, you attract in that way because people are just intrigued by these things that are about you. But it also means when you get talking and in conversation, you can talk from a place of passion and enjoyment about what it is that's it's about you instead of thinking that, oh, there's these things I have to talk about. I have to talk about work or I have to talk about my, uh, my job or I shouldn't talk about ex-partners or I shouldn't talk about sex. You know, when we start getting into that is that we are all in our head and we're not talking from our, our passion or our heart or what we like deeply inspires us. That's interesting because there's like, I, I really like sort of all Jungian psychology and, and, and one of the things at the heart of Jungian psychology is this sort of idea of like, it's never about what it's about. Mm. It's always about something else. And that's really interesting. What you're saying is you might not think to put up there, like I like this because you might think, well, I don't necessarily, you know, you don't necessarily, that don't mean you're going to get like for like, but it means yeah. something else. Yes. You know, because you have interests, it means that there's a depth to you maybe that there isn't if you just don't say what any of your interests are, for example. Yes. The other thing there is that, like, that idea of narrative in there, you know, like, there is this way of doing it, there is this process. And, and that's also, you know, it's never about what it's about because that, the thing with dating, what I'm hearing is the same thing I'll hear if I'm talking to a man who's, having a midlife crisis or, or a career crisis or whatever it is, there's this sort of expectation. There seems to be this expectation that we're sort of, whether, whether we learn it or whether it's in our psyche, that you need to tell me the rules. And then if I do this, this, and this, then I should get this, right? And, and whether it's like a career issue where a guy has gone, listen, I've, I've gone and I've worked hard every day and I've, you know, I stay late and everyone else, I come early and everyone else, I always deliver on time, I always do this and this, but I'm always getting jumped over in terms of, in terms of promotions or whatever, or I've done what I thought I'd do, I got married, I've had kids, I've got a house and somehow it's all still empty, where, where this, this thing that you talk about of like, kind of having to connect with something else that's kind of you, and you can take that into all areas of life, really, can't you? Like, if your life is just, if you're living a life that's fulfilling you, if I'm living a life that's fulfilling me, chances are I'm going to attract people who are interested in having fulfilling lives or, or have similar values to me. And I guess that's the same, I guess that's what you're saying, really, like in terms of the dating is if you show up as you and you're happy as you and you're having a good time as you with you and all your friends, you're going to get people, you're going to get, you know, people you're interested in coming around you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's, and it's also inside of that is that, you know, we want to be happy, but we're not happy all the time. And we don't expect anyone to be happy all the time around us. Right. We expect people to be real. We actually want to, you know, from the experience I've had with working with women um, and the women I've dated is the thing that women want to experience from a man is he wants to feel you. She wants to feel who you are, your edges, the things about you. So not all of that's always going to be beautiful and lovely, but she would rather feel you than you do not feel you, right? So often a lot of guys, a lot of guys I work with come and they're like, oh, you know, I go on dates and the women I always get the same thing. I'm a nice guy, but they don't want to take it any further. And then I, we, we go through some acts, some processes, and we talk about how they're expressing themselves, how their emotions come up for themselves. And so often, what, I, what comes along for them is that they're not really expressing who they are, right? There's this narrative for them that's like, oh, I should be a certain way, so I need to fit into this box. You know, it's a bit like what you're saying with the men, you know, midlife crisis, done the whole get married at this age, have two kids, blah, blah, blah. They did everything they thought would make them happy, but they never, they never checked in with themselves and said, what would make me happy? What do I desire? What's passionate and purposeful in my life? Because it's when we engage in that, in going, what do I want, right? And live our own lives in a way we lead our own lives, that we start to really find the connections, that we really find a passion that we weren't always aware of, right? Like I've worked in the corporate world for a while, and there's a lot of people that just follow all the rules. They follow the rules, they do all the objectives and blah, blah, blah. And like you said, they get jumped over because ultimately what we want to, to what we want, right, is to be around people who have 
something different who are willing to bring their whole self to the experience into the conversations that's in that's so i'll tell you what's coming up for me there when i hear that is that like again this is a kind of a massive cliche but like one of the things that i've heard from men and from friends and from you know everyone who's in when we were at the period i'm a bit older now so the dating bit is kind of gone but like you know there was a there was a period where i had friends and their view was kind of like i always seem to get so far with a girl or a potential partner and then actually it seemed like i was too nice like mm-hmm. I was too much of the nice guy. And then they got overlooked by this guy. They got sort of, the attention got taken by some guy who didn't seem to be particularly nice, um, but seemed to get the kind of, seemed to get get the um, the luck, as it were. So yeah. is, do you think that's a sort of, one, do you think that's true? Do you think that's an age thing? Do you think that, that women tend to change in that period? Or is it, uh, is can you be too nice? Yes, you can be way too nice. And it's 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 one of those things that we see, you know, like I'm I'm 37 now. And I feel like when I was at school, I was probably one of those nice guys. I had lots of female friends, right? They they loved me. I was David, he's, I'd get hugs and you know, and all these things. And if you would have looked and thought, wow, these women love David, he must be, you know, really getting it on. But actually, I was just this nice guy who I listened to all their man problems and everything, and I fancied them across different years, you know. And I, I work now with a lot of men who are just nice. They're really nice. They're kind. They're loving. You know, they have all the hallmarks of being nice. But what they're not doing is they're not putting who they are out there because of their fear of being rejected, of being not accepted, right? So they put out all the things they think are going to be accepted and think they're going to be liked. Now, when you leave this imprint of niceness, what you also do is that People don't feel who you are because there's no boundaries. You're not giving any opinions. You're not disagreeing. You're not polarizing any way, right? And in that way of like, we go to the the kind of archetypes, right? And I always think of a leader of, you know, I think of the king, I think of the, the, the leader, he will make decisions and he will say things that is what's true for him, what's right for him, what's deeply, you know, meaningful to him because it's what it is, because it is true for him, not because he thinks other people are always going to like it, right? And I think this is something that happens with nice guys is that they end up in a relationship and they're just agreeable. They're doing everything their partner wants. I will do everything. And it's the, the kind of basis of this is if I do everything to make you happy, I will be happy too, right? And inside that, there is an assumption that you know what your partner wants to make them ha- wants wants you to do to make them happy, right? And I think, you know, for enough men, we've realized that a lot of, humans all of us men and women but i was talking to say women they don't necessarily know what they want right or what will make them happy until they receive it so a big part of what we want right or what women often want is they want to feel you so they want to hear you know your thoughts your feelings your ideas what upsets you what you hate you know all these things that as a nice guy you're like oh well i don't want to say anything to upset her because you know i don't want to upset her but actually that stops her from feeling who you are as a person, right? It stops, there's, a, there's, there's an inauthenticity when we hide. You know, we always think of inauthenticity as lying, right? But lying isn't just lying. There's lying, there's hiding, there's manipulating. There is telling half-truths. These are all part of inauthenticity. And what you, you find with nice guys is there's a lot of manipulation. There's a lot of, if I give you this, then you're going to give me that. And that's a manipulation right there, right? Yeah. I'm going to try and... Up, it's still manipulation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And inside this, what happens with nice guys is they just end up in this very safe, comfortable zone in their relationships or in their dating lives. And they don't upset anybody. They don't want to be disliked. But in fact, it's that very thing that's stopping them from really connecting with someone. Because when there is all this inauthenticity, and I call it like a fog, like a cloud between two people, when there's all this inauthenticity there, the things that are unsaid, the, the emotions that are not communicated, all these things, they kind of cloud the ability to communicate honestly and openly right and it stops the connection so you so i find that the nice guys i work with is that a lot of the time they tell me the same things they go oh, i'm dating or i'm in relationship because i work with a lot of men who are in relationship and they're like i'm not getting enough sex or i go on dates and i keep getting ghosted or i go on dates and they say i'm a nice guy and that's it 
And it always comes down to the same things. Like I said, there's all these, all these thoughts and feelings and emotions that they're not communicating because they just want to be nice and they just want to be liked with the idea that if I give, if I, if the other person likes me, then I will be happy. But in fact, when we dig deeper into it, there's often a deep unhappiness because there's all these hmm, passions, there's all these ideas, there's all these pursuits that they want to live into, but they don't because they don't think it's acceptable to other people in society. So there's an unhappiness that brews underneath. And I imagine that you come across a lot of guys like this and they end up in their midlife period where it explodes for them, right? They're fed up of being this, having this kind of underlying unhappiness and they want to reach out into the world and maybe they go into destructive tendencies because what it is is they really want to express themselves. They really want other people to feel who they are. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 uh, I can't remember who said it, but there was a, a kind of analogy that I really liked about um, how men kind of slowly withdraw by shutting parts of themselves away throughout their life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that starts off when you're very young, you know, like, don't be boisterous, you know, yeah. the very nature of boisterous is like a boy, it means like a boy. And so, you know, so you turn that bit off, you know, don't, don't, don't be too brash, right? That bit goes, you know, don't, don't be too confident. That bit goes, don't be underconfident. That bit goes, don't show your vulnerability. That bit goes. And eventually there becomes this period of like, it's almost like this, this analogy was like, you become like a ghost really of who you were kind of wandering through your own life and not really knowing you know, asking everyone else to say how they want you to be. You know, what do I have to do to make you happy? What do I have to do to make you happy? What do I have to do to make you happy? What do I have to do to make my boss happy? What do I have to do to make my partner happy? What do I have to keep my children's happy? You know, what car should I drive so that I get the status that I want? It's all, it's all kind of that. And, and that is where that explosion comes because eventually like you're born into this life full of potential and suddenly you know, you're this tiny little thing where you're like, this ain't the life that I'm supposed to have. This ain't, this ain't how the things I'm supposed to be feeling on a daily basis. Is this it? Is, have I just got to grind this out for another kind of 20 years or something? Um, and, and I guess what you're saying under that, surprisingly, that being a husk of a person, people don't find it that attractive. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly that is that we don't even realize that we've just kind of turned into, like you said, this husk of a person, the shell of a person that's almost acting. It's almost this act that we put on, you know? And it's very easy when, and I say this to a lot of people, I say this to a lot of men that I work with, it's like, it's very easy to go to work and have a persona and act at work, right? You go to work and it's like, okay, I'm going to just not do anything to upset anybody. I'm just going to you know, move through, go through the motions, get the promotion every few years, right? But when it comes to your dating life and your relationship, you can only put on an act for so long. Because the parts of you that you are suppressing or the parts of you are hiding, they will come out because it takes a lot of effort to keep up a persona, keep up an act constantly. So it's like, how about we, it's much better to look at those parts and go, I accept you, I'm bringing you into my life and then communicate that with the people and you will find people that move towards you. Like even inside relationship, like one of my clients I've worked with, he was in a relationship and he wasn't as expressed as he wanted to be. He was finding there's a lot of conflict in his relationship. Sex wasn't happening as regularly as he'd like to. And a lot of it really came down to that there was all this unexpressed wants and desires and things he wasn't communicating with his partner. And once we dug through all that and we got that out and why he was doing it and stuff like that, and he started to embrace these elements of himself that he'd been hiding his whole relationship transformed from something that was very stiff and stodgy and very like, I'm like this, she's like that. And I do these things on my own. And to a point where he started to bring in spontaneity into his life, you know, he'd just be like, let's go do this. Let's just rent a car and drive to the coast for the day, you know? And his, he, I think initially he didn't tell his partner he was getting coaching. His partner was like, you know, what's, 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 you've, you've changed, you know, what's, what's this? Like this man is, I love this, you know, I want more of this kind of thing. And I think a lot of us get into this, this, this kind of phase where we, we kind of make ourselves really small, you know, with all the things that we shouldn't do. And, and it's not always consciously going, oh, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't say that. It's just, we've taken all these subconscious messages and we've gone, oh, this is how I need to be, to be safe. This is how I need to be to be loved. This is how I need to be to be accepted. When actually there is no particular way we need to be to receive love and to be cared for. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, a sort of challenging time at the moment as well. I think for a lot of people, I think as as men, I think quite rightly, a lot of questions are being asked of us at the moment. Like to take mm. a good look and go, uh, you know, how do you behave? How do you, uh, you know, how are you going to show up in the world? And and there seems to be like a sort of at two ends of the polar. You've kind of got men who are sort of I come across quite a lot who say, I don't even like, I don't even like other men. Like I'm only ever surrounded by myself. I only feel comfortable with women. I don't like other men. Um, you know, they, um, I'm frightened of other men. I don't like them. Uh, I don't really understand how to be one. You know, you hear that quite a lot. And and then on the other end, you've kind of got these, these group of men who are like, Listen, I should be at it. If, if I want to go and touch up a woman, if I want to, I can, right? And they seem to be like these two, these two kind of opposing areas, and um, and I think people, I think, you know, obviously they're the extremes, but I think even in the middle, there is a sense of like, how how do how do I do this? You know, like I was sort of, you know, like, you know, I haven't dated since like. 1995 or something right but like it was different then you know it was different then like how you how you signaled was different it was all puffing up and like it was all kind of puffing up and being very definite about actually what you want and definitely being a bad boy because everyone wanted a bad boy it was all it was all kind of oasis and nirvana and all that and and so how is that now? I mean, do you do you find that that you've got men coming to you who go like, like the basic tools? Like, do you get men coming to you going, how do how do I flirt now? What level of flirting is appropriate? Yeah, you know, and yeah. you go no dick pics. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get a real range actually. Like, I've I've. I can think of people who come to me and they're like, oh, I'm really, I'm really lacking confidence. I can't approach a woman in a bar, you know, especially when we think about, you know, times not too, the f- too distant past where, you know, you could go into a bar and meet a woman. And I was like, I, they were struggling to find the confidence or have the conversation or know when to ask for a phone number. But equally, I get men at the, at the other end of the experience where they're like, I want a deep, meaningful, spiritual, emotional and intellectual connection. And I'm like, yeah. I understand what you want. And I really have an understanding of both these ends because I've worked with men that have spanned that range. And then when you just say the men you talk of who are like, you know, who are, they don't like men. They're like, I don't like men. I like, I like being around women. They're soft, they're gentle, they're kind. You know, I don't want to, and often those men also are like, I don't want to assert myself on anybody. I don't want to be pushy, super peaceful and all those good things, right? And then you've got men at the other end who are probably very, very like, confident, assertive. This is what I want. This is how it needs to be. The world is changing and it shouldn't change. You know, like you said, very definite, right? And what the thing is, is that there's this, there's a place where not, we don't all have to be the same, right? Because if, even if we move towards the middle, there's a difference for the, so the, the last two men is like, there's, you know, we talk about kind of masculinity and femininity, right? And I don't always like to talk about them in terms of like two separate entities that are inside us, but for teaching purposes as a useful tool, right? Is that there's a part of us that yearns to be really entwined in both those energies, right? Our masculinity, which is, can be very process oriented. It can be very, you know, very quiet, very still, very directed, you know, but there's also this, this feminine expression we want that's like full of flow and energy and chaos and, you know, and it's actually to bring those closer together so we can dance between them and we can move and hold both of them in the same moment together you know so that we can be we can look at the world and go oh yeah the world is changing but that's okay it's good that the world is changing and also we can come to our hearts and connect with the the part of us that is really feminine wants to really be deeply in tune with with women or or you know flow and the softer things in life our emotions but also be connected in the heart to our masculinity which wants to move the world forward protect you know provide you know and all these things it's like I I feel like there's a there's a heart connection in there that we have to be connected to both of those things because there is a place there and I find with 
with a lot of men, it's like, how can we, you know, even with the men at one end who are like, oh, I don't know what to say to a woman. I can't talk. And the men who are like, I want a deep, meaningful spiritual connection. And a lot of the time it's like, how can we get you out of your head and strategizing and thinking and only focusing on your fear, what you don't want. And how can we get you to a place where we can focus on what you'd really like to happen? Right. And we start taking action from that place because I think we, we all really, we want to be more integrated, right. In, in the way that we move forward, we want to bring harmony to our, to our being and our, and our worlds as well. We want harmony in our, in our lives, but harmony looks different to different people. And, and also, like I was just thinking there when you were talking, that play element must be really, really, really central to that. Because, yeah. if, you know, which, which if, if ever I've been like kind of talking about this subject and, and I'm trying to sort of advise a friend or something on this, because like, you know, mercifully, one issue I never had was having be- was a lack of beautiful, intelligent women in my life. I always seem mm-hmm. to there always seemed to be an abundance around because they were just in my set and I genuinely really enjoyed a company of women like so that there was always kind of women around so I never really had that issue but like what, what I would sort of come across would be like the kind of consequence of seeing it seeing dating or, or attracting a partner as kind of the game or the challenge or the problem or the skill to learn would be like I'd always say like well look at it like a friend you know like maybe you do want a really deep friendship you know you've met this bloke you you want a really deep friendship with him right you really like him you get on really well but if you went up to him and said listen I want a really deep friendship with you let's let's be best friends you're like who does that? Like, you can't, you can't do that. Like you do that when you're at school. If you do that now, someone's likely to go, hang on. I'm not sure who this person is. Like, yeah. we just move hanging out. Like, let's just continue hanging out. And, and, and I think that that mindset seems to come in quite a lot with men. Like I've been seeing her a few times now and I feel really serious, but I don't think she feels the same. So I've asked her and now I'm being ghosted or whatever. And mm-hmm. you're like, couldn't you just, my view, and I might be completely wrong with this, is can't, couldn't you just stay in play a little bit longer and see where it went? Couldn't you just stay in, um, you know, and then in six months' time, in a year's time, you might find you're in that relationship that you wanted, like a friend. You know, you kind of, you meet someone, and I did skating a lot. You meet someone, and you're skating, and the next thing you think, God, I've, me and this guy have been mates for like five years or something now. But you didn't go, that's the friend, that's the best friend for me. <laughs> um, so do you think it's around, um, I guess there's two things at play there. I guess there's that kind of willingness to sit in play and there's a sort of sunk cost bias there must be for in dating, like right? that kind of, but if I spend six months with this person and it ain't the one, that's another six months I've lost. Mm-hmm. So h- how do you get them to negotiate? that can you yeah 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 one of the things that we see there with this idea of like okay i've met someone and and women do this as well right my partner she works with women and and we have wonderful conversations about you know what's going on for the people we work with right and it's like we have this idea that it's a fear it's a fear of loss so we like someone and the ultimate fear that really is there is we like them and we're not sure if they like us back right? Because it's around our own self-worth. It's nothing to do with how they're acting, right? Because the chances are they probably like us and they've showed us all the signals, right? And it's our own self-worth and our own, you know, insecurities, right? So we want to verbalize it. We want to kind of, what I call it, like lock it in. You know, I want to get this contractually organized so that I, that creates some safety for me, right? And if I know that you want a relationship and I want a relationship, ah, then I can relax. I don't, I can leave this anxiety that I'm feeling behind, the only problem is, is that all it does is lead you to the next anxiety, right? Which the next anxi- anxiety usually is, I don't want them to leave, <laughs> right? For a lot of people, it literally just shifts from one to the other, right? This, this, this illusion that, you know, oh, we've locked it in. I feel safe now. I feel secure. And like you said, I think there is definitely a moment for me of play, but also learning to feel 
right? Because when we're trying to strategize from our minds and we're like, okay, does she like me? I'm not sure. I need to get a contractual agreement that she feels the way I do. We stop being like, ah, we stop being in the moment and enjoying being with this person and feeling how it's going because we've now clicked into our kind of story of how things should go. Okay. We've been seeing each other for three months. That means now by the, you know, by what the, the book says, we should be talking about, you know, something serious. Okay, cool. So we're going to, I'm going to have a serious conversation about what she wants and what I want. And, you know, for a lot of time, a lot of women really want men to do this. Right. And it's this paradoxical thing is that we are, we're all coming from our own wounded childhoods. Right. So you're having this conversation, you going, okay, you know, I like you, do you, you know, want to be boyfriend and girlfriend after three months? And a woman might also be in her fears of like, oh my God, this guy wants me. I don't know if I'm good enough. What does he, why does he want to be with me? And she won't even be aware of what's happening, right? So it's like when we are so unaware of these stories that are playing out, we end up doing these, you know, quite dysfunctional things in relationships. So I think I, I like to say to people more and more, let's come into the moment and feel what's happening instead of trying to work out, strategize, plan. Because when we get into that space, we become disconnected from each other, right? Because we are sitting over dinner, having a conversation because we're thinking, okay, I need to know all these things about her. I need to project onto her to show her the sort of man that I'm going to be as a partner, and actually what we miss out on is that actual moment to moment connection that's being built and feeling that and enjoying that and actually speaking into that. Right. And, and we end up basically, you know, in our own worlds, in our own heads, thinking about something else. So when we do have a conversation of like, oh, you know, is this going to go somewhere? We're asking it from our minds. We're asking it from our egoic mind that's in fear and worry and loss instead of just going, hmm, what does this feel like? This feels good. I want to keep going with this. And I want this to be more and just acting it, just doing it and going, okay, I want this to be more. So I'm going to just be like, okay, instead of, you know, seeing her once a week, I'm going to start integrating into her life and meet my friends. And I'm going to start, you know, because sometimes it just doesn't need to be said. It doesn't need to be explained. You just do it. You just lean into the feeling and follow it. And I know you might, listeners might be hearing this and going, oh, but you know, I've been hurt. I've been burnt in the past when I've done that. And yeah, that's kind of part of the process of life, you know, like, you know, I'm sure Lawrence didn't stop skating when he fell off his off his board a few times. You know, you Amazing. just learn to <laughs> and you just learn to feel the board a bit better, you know? You learn to you, you know, you're not thinking about oh, the ground there looks like this and then I'm going to need to you just when you're on the board and you're surfing, you, you know, literally like surfing, you know, you're riding, you're feeling it as you're moving and this is the beauty of when we can stop strategizing and we can we can feel more in the moment in our relationships in our you know, intimate relationships, especially is like bringing some presence and actually feeling situations. Yeah. And it's, it's such, I mean, again, it's like, you can take that and you can expand that out to life when you, because it's like, yeah. I believe a lot of the time, you know, I know this from myself and through various periods in my life, it's like, I'm trying to mitigate all risk. Yeah. Like if I do that, that's going to do that. If I do that, that's going to go wrong. Like, and then, and then that's time or money or resources wasted that I don't have. It's like, it's, it's all of that kind of stuff. And, and yet, and this is like going to sound like a massive cliche. And yet you get 80 goes around the sun, then you're going to die anyway. Mm. <laughs> you know, like life is ludicrously kind of short and no matter what we you know, my view anyway is no matter what we say about life, no matter how we dress it up, no matter what you believe, um, this consciousness, as we know it, will end at some point, right? This, yes. this physical thing that we're living, whether you believe in an afterlife or whatever God you believe in, this physical bit will go. And mm. one thing that's sure about this journey that we're on is it's going to have absolutely beautiful, stunning moments there's going to be sunrises that you cannot believe there's going to be people in your life that you think how did i get these people in my life there's going to be a, a dinner you taste that is so good that it can bring tears to your eyes you know there's art there's movies there's you know if, if it was a computer game how much would you have to pay for the rendering of the the wind blowing the trees you know we couldn't afford to build it and it's there and Everyone we love is going to die. Yeah. 
at some stage. And if we don't see it, then they're going to see us die. You know, everything that's beautiful will get destroyed at some stage, you know, and you're going to get hurt and you will do stuff and you will fail. And, and yet so much of our life is lived. So much of my life is lived in mitigation, like trying to go, and I'm sort of not saying that like you've just got to run out and do all the maddest stuff because they don't care. Like, of course, you've got you've got to plan, you know, like hope for the best, but like kind of expect the worst in a way. Like this is a very brief, beautiful gift that we have. And I think that thing of looking at anything, whether it's a career or a love life or um you know, an interest, a, a project, whatever it is like that ability to go into it with I'm just going to feel my way through this and I'm just going to enjoy it and it may not work out. And if it didn't work out, I still had the good bits of it because that's, that's all we can really have. All we're going to take, all we're going to have is our experiences ultimately. <clears throat> but I do think it's like someone once said, I can't remember who said it to me, but they said like, there's lies in life, you know, there's, there's lies in life. What, and everything we do, we try and do to hide these, these things from us, you know, like we're all going to die. Like ultimately you live your life through your own eyes. You're kind of on your, you're kind of on your own, you know, um, there is no real meaning other than the meaning that you make up of it. You know, there's no prize. You're going to get a prize at the end. You know, it's just the experience that it is. And it's random. Yeah. It's, it's random. And they're, they're like the four bits of life that we try and build everything around to go, that ain't true. You know, like, that ain't true. I'm not going to die. I know I'm, not, I know I'm going to die, but really I, I live my life like I'm not going to. If I do all these things, the random stuff won't happen. You know, like, oh, there is a meaning. I've made this thing up. That's what it's all about. I'm right and you're all wrong you know and so i don't know i've gone off on a bit of a tangent there but it's just that idea of kind of of how do we get to that place where we can be in relationship with another not invested that it's that i'm not going to get hurt you know and uh, and in and invested that i can just take the good bits anyway and it may end and that weren't a waste of time you know, it's like they seem to be the two things. Will it be a waste of time? Will I get hurt? And like, who knows? <laughs> you know, who knows? You know, and and probably with relationships, you're probably going to get hurt. Really, actually, if you if if you're brutal, because if it is the love of your, you know, if it ain't the love of your life, it will break up at some stage. If it is the love of your life you're going to watch them die or they're going to watch you die. You know, it's not like you're going to get hurt. So how do we, I mean, that's, that's, that's too big a question. How do we sort of bring ourselves to terms to enter into relationships from a place of going, I'll just take it as it is. I think the thing that I, I do a lot with people is, is, is nurturing acceptance is also talking into, okay, you know, I really, we'll take a really grounded example, right? You go on a date. A lot of guys are like, okay, I'm going on this date. This girl seems really hot. I want it to go really well. I don't want it to go badly. Okay. Understand. You want it to go well. You know, you want to be, put your best foot forward and be that guy. Okay. So this, I like to do an exercise. Like, okay, let's go through the risk mitigation strategies first, right? How can you mitigate all this risk? Okay. So they, you can really go far with risk mitigation, right? And to the point where you could actually get to a point where the only way to mitigate any risk of anything going wrong is by not going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Oh, I don't want to look stupid. Okay, cool. You don't want to, you know, don't want to dress badly. Okay, wear something super simple. Cool. I don't want to say anything that might upset her. Okay, you need to work out everything that's going to be acceptable to her and say nothing that's not going to be acceptable. Okay, I don't want to, and, you know, we go through these things. I don't want to be rejected. Okay, how can you not be rejected? And ultimately you'll get to a point where you shouldn't even go because that's the only way to mitigate all the risk, right? But the power comes when I can say, do you know what? I'm willing to go on this date. 
and I'm willing to look stupid. And I'm okay with that. I can accept that as an outcome. I can accept that that might happen because I'm willing to put myself who I am and say, this is the man I am. And this is what my life's about, where I want my life to go. Right. Because then I also give my chance of having the best outcome. The ultimate outcome is this deep, you know, really being deeply connected to this woman. And if, if we're talking about life, right, as a, as a bigger piece is you can walk through your life trying to mitigate all risk. Right. And I've met people that have done this. They mitigate all risks. They're in the safest of jobs. They don't travel anywhere that's potentially dangerous. They married the first person who they felt would never leave them, you know, and all these things. But it kind of goes back to what we said about the inauthenticity earlier. It's like you end up in this place where there's nothing, there's nothing that lights you up. There's no passion, right? So you have to accept and be willing to, to allow for the worst possible outcome, which in, you know, in dating and relationships is being hurt because when you can go, I'm willing to be hurt because I can recover from it. Right. It won't be the end of my life. And also there's a, this, one of the other things is I can learn something from this hurt. There's always a lesson, you know, there's always a lesson in, in, in a breakup in, in a, in a relationship. And if you ever go, I was in a relationship, but there was no lesson there, then you can, you, you have to be very concerned at that point because you may end up just repeating that same pattern again. When we don't learn the lesson, we don't see it. It just comes back to us. You know, we find ourselves, you know, often men, we end up in relationships and we have the same pattern of relationship happen to us again and again. You know, for me, it happened over the course of maybe eight or nine years in my twenties where I'd meet someone amazing. She'd be great. Then the relationship would get into a point where there's a lot of conflict and turmoil. There's disconnection. I'm not sharing how I'm feeling. They're kind of trying to get me to talk. I don't want to talk. And then the relationship breaks down because the communication's all messed up. Yeah. Right. And this happened to me again and again and again. And I at one point was like, oh, you know, what? it's just women. This is how women are. And then one day I realized, I was like, it's not women. This is me. You know, this pattern keeps happening. And when I said to myself, you know, I'm going to give, I'm willing to put who I am out and give my, give my heart to somebody, right. And I risk my, my heart broken. Only then was I able to really connect with somebody. And I had to obviously do a lot of work on looking at, why I was so afraid of communicating my emotions. Why, you know, was I avoidant around certain topics? Why did I not want to talk about some of the things I've done in my life because of shame and so forth? But it's when we're willing to go, I'm willing to be hurt. I'm willing to be seen. I'm willing to be judged. It's then that we can actually live. We can actually live because anything else, anything less than that, right, is just us hiding and is us being inauthentic to life. And also it caps off our enjoyment. You know, because what happens is if you don't, you're not willing to allow for the lowest of emotion, the hurt, the pain, the shame, the suffering, you just lose the top end, the joy, the ecstatic joy. And you end up living in this, what I like to call gray scale in the middle. Yeah. Everything's just a different color of gray, you know, whereas when you're willing to go, oh, I'm going to be really hurt. I'm going to be, you know, one on a day and I, I really just said who I was and I talked about all the things I love and the things I hate and at the end of it, she said, you know what? It was an amazing date, but you're not the sort of guy I want to spend time with. You can go, you know what? I feel hurt by that, but it's okay because I can recover. I can move on from this. This is not the end of who I am. And there's an acceptance in that. When you can accept the worst, then the best is really possible for you. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, I really like the word authentic. You know, I, th I think it's a really great word. And like, it's like you almost have to partner it with resilience because yeah. there's the one, there's the one, the, the bit of like, you know, it's such a thing to live an authentic life, right? Something I think most of us aspire to, but there's like, there's the, I'm willing to show myself completely on one side and, and I can handle it if that's not enough people kind of needs to be on the other side it's like it has to be enough for me and that's that um that's what i think in life really for me has certainly been a sort of a sweet spot for me to hit is kind of that place of going i'm not perfect I'm never going to be for perfect um i'm willing to be seen if you want to think i'm ridiculous then go ahead and think I'm ridiculous. Like that, that's okay. Of course, I'm going to get hurt by stuff. No one's completely bulletproof, but it's the cost that I'm willing to pay to be me. I'm willing to accept the pain of, of criticism 
sometimes or or ridicule or whatever it is because because I'm also it's important to me to be me it's important to live a life where I go that's the life and that's the person I wanted to be um so that's why I really like that idea of authenticity in what you do of that way of showing up as me I'm gonna take the hits but we might have a good time together and I may not be the person for you and that's fine yeah I'll just keep knocking on the door yeah yeah Um, yeah I mean, we've been. We could. Me, I get the feeling that me and you could talk for ages. Um, the, the, one of the main reasons I got you into the group um, was because we done a similar talk on Clubhouse, mm. uh, and loads of guys who are in this group not on Clubhouse, and they were like, "I really wanted that. I really wanted to hear that one, and I couldn't." Um, so, sadly, we haven't been out to go live. So, I'm just trying to imagine some of the questions that I would have got, and uh, I just want to end with a few of those questions. Okay. Yeah, sounds perfect. One of the ones I remember getting was like, um, it was around online, around online dating, because obviously that's kind of in everyone's mind at the moment. Frankly, we're coming out of that a little bit, it may seem, but it seems, still seems to be a key way that people meet. What's, what's your top sort of tips, really? Where, or tips is the wrong word, because that's that game way. But what's the biggest mistake you see men making? Um, the biggest mistake I see men is not making an effort, not making an effort to have a good profile with, with great pictures, you know, good quality pictures that show a story about their life. You know, it's a big one is not looking at a group of pictures, you know, four or five pictures, you go Tinder, Bumble, these, these apps and just throwing on a load of pictures and not really thinking about what does this picture say about me? Is this a reflection of my life and who I am, you know, um, and not having good quality pictures that are clear, you know, something that shows, your face well lit close you know some so someone can look at that and go that's who that is right so you know story and pitch is a big one not actually not leaving the impression with the bio you know leaving it really bland oh you know i like to have a good time i like to have a drink here and there i like to go away with my friends and blah 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 everyone does let's let's be specific Right. What do you, who are you? Who is this person? Again, people want to feel who you are. And it might be things, you might put down things that you, what stops us is like, I don't want to be judged. Oh, I don't want someone to think that, you know, this is stupid about me or whatever. Like maybe you love collecting stamps. Say you love collecting stamps. That's fine. Yeah. Like actually say, this is what I'm about, right? This is what I love and this is what I hate. This is what I enjoy. And take some time to write it and evolve it as well. Once you've written your your profile, once you've taken the pictures, don't just go, boom, that's it. That's stuck in the sand for the next six months, one year. Yeah. There'll be times where you will be thinking about maybe a question or something that comes up or something about you that you're like, oh, I really, this is something I really enjoy. I really dislike or whatever it may be. You think, oh, let me add that to my dating profile. Put it in there. You know, like I just did a review. I do reviews with men often with their dating profile. I did one with one of my clients and, we look for his pictures and I was like, okay, there's a nice range of pictures here, but actually there's a couple here that you just, you just don't need these pictures. They don't add anything here. Or, you know, I was like, what sort of, what do you, what do you, I, I know him, I worked with him for three months. I said, there's no mention of your creativity here. You don't mention the fact that you work in a creative industry. You love to make things. You love to create things from scratch, whether that's painting and drawing and stuff like that. He says, yeah. I was like, but that's who you are. So you're not, people aren't going to feel who you are. So he started to change that. And then suddenly he's like, yeah, I'm getting more dates on some of these apps now, you know, right. because, and I'm meeting women who are a lot more in tune with these things that I'm enjoying, but also they have their own creativity. That's interesting to me. Is some of that like a fear of like a fear of not casting your net too wide as well? Yeah. Like, Cause if you go like, I like stamps, it might be like, hang about, I'm only going to get people that like stamps. But what you're saying is actually it's not it's not about the stamps. It's about the fact that you have interests in stuff. Yeah. People level rather than just here I am in a bar, here I am out to dinner, here I am on holiday, which of course everyone likes and does. Yes. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. And even the stamps is like, how can we talk about the things you do in a way that elevates them to the real reason behind them? Like if you collect stamps, someone collects stamps. And I had a friend that collects stamps, right? And you'd never know it if you saw him. He's a big hunky. He's, he's about five foot nine, very hunky. You walk anywhere with him and every woman just pays attention to him, right? And he collects stamps. But actually, when you talked, when I talked to him about it one day, 
it was that he has this, he's like, I love the rarity and the creativity that goes into some of these stamps from around the world. I was like, so you're really a collector of rare and unusual items. Yeah. He's like, yeah. And actually it's like, you love the culture. You want to know about the story. And, you know, it's when we start getting into the deeper underneath meaning of things and we can talk from that place because that's beautiful, right? We all want to be involved with someone who's deeply involved, wants to know about you know, rare and unfound items. And, you know, we, it's, it's learning to tell a good story. It's not a lie because the story is completely true, but it's being able to feel into the deeper passion that's there and communicate from that place. Yeah, and philately will get you everywhere. Little little joke there for the stamp collectors who might be. Yeah. I'm sure there's millions of them. Um, so the other question we'll finish off with. Um, oh no, we won't finish off because of the question question I ask everyone. But the other question is, I guess, first dates. Mm. What, what's where? What's a good first date? So I think the thing with first dates is you've got to you've got to judge. First of all, if you listen to the person you're talking to, right? You've been talking to someone for a, a, a period of time before you go on a first date. Now, you want to be deep in your awareness of who the person is. So maybe you've been talking and maybe you talked about some bars or you maybe you talked about some interest that the two of you have. And maybe you see something pop up on, you know, some sort of events or maybe, I don't know, maybe you got, you're, you're talking to a woman and she loves walking. She loves outdoor walks, Right. Now you're like, oh, you know, I'm interested. Maybe you're not even that interested in outdoor walks, but you're open to it, right? Which is a key thing, being open. So maybe you go on Google and you go, oh, this is really beautiful walk. It's like it takes you across a beach and through some hills or through some farms, whatever. But it's a, you know, well-known walk or it's a really interesting walk. Like do a bit of research, read about it, go find something, like make an effort, you know, and then go, hey, we're doing this. We're going to go on this walk. And, and maybe it is, you know, in these times going for a walk is perfectly legal, you go for a few hours, but it, it shows that you took an interest. You've been listening. You're aware, but you're also open to trying something new and different. And maybe it's a case of you just want to, you know, some people just like to go to a bar, you know, so they can just sit and talk, right? And they can just get to know that person. Cool. You know, choose that as well. But, you know, choose a comfortable setting that you're happy in. But, you know, it really comes down to, you know, put some of yourself into the date, you know, not just going, okay, oh, I take all women to this certain place or, you know, ah, uh, I'm not going to go out for dinner because people don't want to go out for dinner. There is a whole thing about some people don't like going out for dinner on the first date. Um, but I like to, a friend of mine, he used to, his thing, and it probably still is, is he will take women on a walk in a particular part of London that he really likes or he's interested in. And he would like meet them by the river and then he'll, they'll just walk. He goes, sometimes he doesn't even go in a particular direction. He just finds it interesting to walk, talk, look at the landmarks, stop at some of the buildings because that's what he's interested in. So it's like, put some of yourself into your, into your first dates. Great. Um, I see you've got, you've got a course coming up in May. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can so I've got a, about that and then tell us how people can keep getting contact or keep in contact with you. Yeah. Yeah. So through a lot of the work I did with coaching, I found that a lot of men, it's like we're talking about, they, they they can't feel what's going on for them. They can't feel the people they're with. And a lot of this comes from a disconnection from one's own emotions. And when we're disconnected from our emotions, we struggle to make decisions. We struggle to know what we want to do with ourselves. We struggle with our confidence as well. And our communication doesn't come as powerfully as we'd like it to. So and all these things affect dating and relationships. So I found that I was taking my clients through the same processes over a course of like three or four sessions. So I boiled this down into a five week course, which I'm running for a group of men and I have a number of men already signed up for it. So it's like a five week course. We start in May, it'll be the first week of May and it's every Wednesday night. Uh, it's five weeks. So it takes us through into the first week of June. So yeah, like you can get in contact with me. I've got a discount code that I offer as well. I think it's conversations with David. Maybe I'll be able to put the link to the, to the event right yeah. there. And um, yeah, you can come and be with me and we, you know, sit of a group of men talking about how we can be better men. Cause that's the key to this. Like, you know, coming together, talking about it, learning together as well, doing various exercises to, to be able to deal with conflict and strife and to feel more, communicate better and, you know, be more present. You know, it's a big part of it is being present to what we're feeling, but be present to what other people are feeling. And then when we can do these things, the, the ability to create deeper connections just skyrockets for men. It really does. And it's like every time I've run through this contact with clients, I've seen that this, like their relationships and their dating just starts to get so much better, so much deeper, and they're so much happier, you know, and there's all these other side effects of family and stuff. So I'm really looking forward to running it. It's only, you know, it's only a couple of weeks away now. Great. Um, 
So these are really the final two questions. I ask them to everyone. So the first one is, if you could go back in time and meet yourself as a younger man, what was the one bit of advice you'd give yourself? Mm. One piece of advice. Knowing oh. you probably wouldn't listen. <laughs> no, yeah, no, definitely. I would probably say... Um, I'd probably tell myself, when you think you failed, you haven't failed, you can get back up and keep going. There's nothing wrong with failure. Don't be ashamed of failing. I think that was a, that'd be a really big one for me. It's like yeah. my relationship to failure. Yeah, that is a big one, isn't it? It can yeah. feel like the end. Yeah. The end. Yeah. Okay. And what books had the most impact on you? Oh, uh, yeah. I can say I read this book at 21 years old and I, I still have two copies usually. It's called Conversations with God. Great book. Yeah. Really good book. And I almost didn't want to, a friend of mine, gave it to me on my 21st birthday. And I was like, I'm not really into like church and stuff, you know? And she was like, no, 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 read it. You enjoy this. And then I read the book and I read it in a weekend and I hadn't read a book since I was about 12 at that point. Okay. So uh, that brings us to the end. Thank you very much, David. I'm going to make sure that all the tags and everything goes in with this as it goes out. Um, if you're watching this within the group, uh, I'm really sorry guys that we couldn't go live. I don't know what happened, but, uh, that was David Chambers. I'm Lawrence Johns. This is Thursday for Knowledge, and we've had it here. All right. Take care. See you all soon. Thank Bye. you, guys.